Welcome to the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm Sam Marks. And I'm Johnny FD. We're self-made entrepreneurs who invest our own money and use modern technology to invest like a boss. Join us each week for exclusive interviews with our network of modern investors, business owners, and multimillionaires to discover new ways to invest our hard-earned cash. Hey guys, it's Johnny and welcome to episode 21 of the Invest Like a Boss podcast. I'm really excited this week to have Gregor Gregerson, the founder of Silver Bullion, talking with Sam. So Sam is going to be asking him all the questions that everybody has been just kind of racking their brains about on. What is the best way to buy either silver or gold? Is it better to buy it in paper form uh, where you can kind of just trade it through either gold ETFs and other types of kind of on paper holdings or should you actually physically have the coins or the bars in a safe somewhere in a safe deposit box somewhere in your home uh, or not in a bank and they're going to go through all that in this episode I think it's so fascinating whether you think you want to buy gold or not or silver or not it's one of those things where I think everyone should just have this as something in the back of your mind that as an alternative he has a great story Sounds like a great company, and I think we're going to enjoy this episode, so check it out. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Invest Like a Boss. Today, we have on Gregor Gregerson, who is the owner and director of Silver Bullion in Singapore. Gregor, pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> We've recently had a, a ton of questions flying in around purchasing precious metals. I think it, it kind of signals to the ambiguity of the entire category of investing in precious metals. So it's great to have you on the show to, to clear some of up, uh, this up for, for all of our audience. Yeah, great. Uh, shoot away. <laughs> well, I wanted to start the episode a little bit about kind of what led you into the category and then ultimately into silver bullion. Well, for me, it all started back in 2008. Uh, at the time, I was working for Commerzbank, the second biggest bank in Germany. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was um, a senior data architect building compliance systems and trading systems. And I was actually in um, the trading room when Lehman Brothers ended up going bankrupt. And wow. I sort of had a first-hand view of what it was like in the trading room when counterparty risk becomes a big issue and people stop trusting each other. Mm. And it became very apparent that our financial system is basically all based on trust. Yeah. Uh, if Bank A no longer trusts that Bank B actually will be able to return the money they sent them, then everything stops and, you know, so the whole thing can basically implode. And at the time, I saw people go and basically rush to the store and buy physical gold and silver. And I was standing there, sort of scratching my head, kind of going, hmm, that might not be a bad idea. And interestingly enough, silver... Uh, as well as gold, they kept on falling during that time. So when I finally said, well, it might make sense to go and buy a little bit of bullion, uh, it was too late. I couldn't get any. I went to the bullion store in Frankfurt and they told me they only buy silver. They didn't sell any silver. Hmm. I was especially interested in silver at the time. And so I went to another store and, and I was told the same thing. And then, you know, I tried going to another one again and, and went through 12 different stores in the Frankfurt area. Wow. It's a financial capital in, in uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. And nobody had anything. Everything was sold out. And and that sort of was a big message for me because when you have a financial crisis and, you know, you probably want to have what everybody wants to have. So it, it became very clear that owning gold and silver, physical, will be what you should have when the next crisis comes. Mm -hmm. And because... The reasons of the 2008 crisis were ne never really properly addressed. I mean, I mean, it's you know the excessive debt, uh, 40 years of accumulated debt, the amount of leverage in the system, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. These things have all been put under the carpet, and they're going to come back with a vengeance. And when that happens, I realized I want to be holding some physical gold, some physical silver, and I want to hold in a jurisdiction where I can be reasonably sure that it will be protected. And it will not be nationalized the way it, it has been nationalized in Germany before, as well as in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What year did it happen in Germany? The nationalization, it, it happened uh, during the 30s. So it's not so far off from when it happened in the U.S. It was it was one of the things that the Nazi did um, mm -hmm. ahead of World War Two. And it's but and it's interesting because it's not just a, an extreme government like that was in Germany at the time. It was also in the U.S. under who was it Roosevelt or Roosevelt, yes. yeah. It's, it's the U.S. did it because, in essence 
since the U.S. was under, in, under the Great Depression and they needed to create jobs, mm -hmm. and if your currency is fully backed by gold, then you cannot just print money. Mm -hmm. But the government needed to essentially print money in order to build the Hoover Dam and other public projects. And if you make your currency convertible to gold, then people will just go and convert it to gold. Uh, so the solution was to make gold illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, then, as you know, it was revalued uh, shortly thereafter. The key thing about the nationalization in the U.S. was, well, I think it, it was April 1st, 1933, April 5th was my birthday. Um, you had about 10 days or so to turn in your gold. And if you didn't, then it became pretty much like contraband. I mean, I mean, officially, you could get up to 10 years in prison or pay a $10,000 fine, which was a lot more money back then than it is mm -hmm. today. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it was almost like I would... You know, compare it to heroin. So, you know, one day you have an asset being gold, and the next day that's becoming heroin. <laughs> yeah. As far as the law is concerned. So, and the other thing to keep in mind is this didn't just apply to U.S. citizens. Uh, anybody who held gold in the U.S. had the gold nationalized. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a case of a, a Swiss national who had mm -hmm. gold in a safe deposit box in New York, which was confiscated. Um, and you know, if they would discover the gold, they might charge you up to two times the value of the gold mm -hmm. penalties for not having declared it, which, uh, again, foreigners might not even be aware of it. So it's a key lesson, I think, out of it, out of all of this is if you have a big financial crisis, if you have a systemic risk where the whole economy is, is in doubt, then governments will just change rules. Right. But whatever makes the most sense for them and, and allows them to survive the crisis. Right. And if your gold is stored under their jurisdiction, then, you know, there's a good chance that it might be nationalized. And it's almost ironic because one of the main reasons people would buy gold is as a hedge or in case of something like this happening. And that might be when your gold or your precious metals are at actually at the most risk. Yes. Personally, I see three important systemic risks, which if you store your gold correctly, you know, you can, you can address. There is the, the currency risk. Mm -hmm. you now, is there's a possibility of people not trusting the US dollar anymore, for example. For example, if the US were to raise a lot of tariffs to China and so on, China might retaliate by sell by dumping US treasuries. If mm -hmm. US treasuries are being dumped, other countries might fo you know follow suit and suddenly there might be it's kinda of like a herd mentality. Suddenly there might be a loss of trust in the US dollar. And hyperinflation is just a, a loss of trust in our currency. So in a scenario like this, owning some gold and silver will basically protect you from Mm -hmm. such eventuality. Another big systemic risk is a financial collapse, which is what, you know, I prompted me to start this whole thing, uh, as I saw in the end of 2008. In 2008, governmental bailouts basically kept the whole system from imploding. Mm -hmm. If we would not have had bailouts, we would probably have had to do bail-ins uh, or let companies go bankrupt. Because banks are so interconnected, uh, the whole system will basically implode. So, you have bailouts, which was the least painful one. You would have had bail-ins where customers who have assets with banks, checking accounts, savings accounts, and so on, would basically get a haircut and would have some money taken by the bank, as happened in Cyprus. Mm -hmm. Or if you let the whole thing go as its natural ways, then you know you it, it will be much worse than this. So the idea is to protect yourself again. You hold some gold. You hold some silver. But you don't keep it with a bank necessarily who will be affected by such a financial collapse. You either hold it yourself or you hold it with an entity which is uh, you know, well removed from the financial system itself. And just in physical form, you don't hold it as an IOU where the gold actually is not there. Basically not paper silver, but physical gold and silver. Right. So that's there's obviously a, a large debate depending on who you talk to about buying gold or precious metal shares or potentially mining stocks or actually buy, buying bullion and, and physical gold, silver, precious metals. And I tend to fall into the, the category of wanting to hold physical gold for all the reasons that you mentioned. And I'm, I'm guessing that's that's entirely your perspective as well. It depends what you want to do with it. Mm -hmm. So for our customers, you know, we, we try to understand what, what the mentality is. If somebody wants to buy gold today and sell it next week, then physical bullion is not the right thing for you to buy because mm -hmm. the margins, the cost is high of buying physical. Mm -hmm. So if you're a that sort of person, you're better off getting a future contract 
or say an ETF. So you're well off with paper because paper gives you price exposure. But if you're looking at it more from an insurance point of view as a way of protecting yourself mm -hmm. from some of the scenarios I mentioned, then you are not going to get that by buying paper. You're going to have to go with the physical bullion. So literally all of our customers are buying bullion, they're storing it you know, for the very long term, uh, four, five, six, seven years. We less than 1% of the bullion we sell, we actually have buyback requests for. So our customers are storing it and they're storing it as an insurance foremost, more than as an as a investment. The idea is you buy it and you kind of hold and when something really bad happens, that money or that value is going to be saved no matter what. Right. So, uh, if that's your goal, then definitely you have to go for physical. The the company's name is Silver Bullion. Is the majority of what you sell silver or is it is it a mixed bag? Um, it's about 50-50 by value. Mm -hmm. so that's quite unusual because typically uh, I would say 90-95% will be gold for a typical bullion dealer. Mm -hmm. So in our sense, 50-50 by value. Basically means we're sell we're selling seventy ounces of silver, probably one ounce of gold. It turns out to be the same value. So there are definitely a way to towards the silver side, and, and hence the name. Uh, the name is partially called Silver Bullion because the reason I started the company was that in Singapore, when I moved to Singapore, um, there was no place I could actually buy physical silver. Wow. What year was this, Gary? That was 2009. Huh, that's interesting, yeah. Yeah, when I was working in Germany, I had already moved to Singapore. The bank just sent me back on a four-month project, a mm -hmm. project to Frankfurt. So with my experience in the trading room, I pretty much was, you know, set that I want to buy some physical silver, keep it in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And when I went out to look for a place to buy it, nobody was selling it. So that's when I realized, okay, if nobody's selling it, then maybe I ought to be going ahead and, and start the company. And so Silver Bullion was born with the initial uh, mission to basically provide liquidity for silver in Singapore. And then later on, we moved much more into the storage and the wealth protection side. We started off creating that liquidity for silver. Mm. Yeah, what, what was actually the first piece of gold or silver that you bought? Was it right after the, the financial crisis or was it, in, was it not until you got to uh, Singapore? You know, I ended up going through these 12 different bullion dealers and <laughs> there was one place where a guy just bought the last 200 maple leaves just in front of my nose. And <laughs> uh, I, I then ended up going to the... Um, I mean, I was at the gift shop of the European Central Bank. Mm -hmm. I just ended up wandering there, and I talked with the guy at the counter, who turned out to be the director of the, of the gift shop. And I told him my story. I'm trying to find silver, blah, blah, blah. I can't get it anywhere. And he said, well, come back in three days. I'll give you, a, I'll get you a one kg uh, silver bar. And true enough, three days later. I'd like one of those too. <laughs> <laughs> those look real pretty on your desk. I bought the bar, and uh, the Herreos bar, mm -hmm. and I had to pay 19 percent tax in oh. germany at the time oh, then i brought it to singapore and i paid another seven percent import tax in singapore at the time there was still tax on it the tax is gone now uh -huh. uh, but you know it was sort of for me to understand and and get a feeling for it and i but for me there's the mental side of things whereas the rational side of you can say yeah i understand this i understand that and so on but that's and there's a deeper sort of emotional or feeling sort of side mm -hmm. when i was in that trading room and i saw what happened it became very real to me that we are going to have the bigger financial crisis and we're not going to get any silver and gold when mm -hmm. the crisis is there so i might as well start doing it now so I, I didn't have any doubts anymore about about doing this it just made sense and when i moved back to singapore and nobody was selling silver it just seemed to make sense to start silver bullion as a company mm -hmm. and then it made sense to start storage and the place we stored at which was one of the major vaults here uh, had some some problems which i didn't like which i wanted to solve and the only way of solving them was to create our own storage facility so again it seemed to be like a, a continuous set of uh, steps which just seemed to be obvious or you know it just made sense in mm -hmm. order to create a safe store of value mm -hmm. and and so the place in Singapore, your, your facility, you basically took out a location and renovated it almost like a, I'm guessing, like a bank vault. Uh, yes. But, you know, what happened is we, we started off the, the system. And once you study, you know, the way gold and silver is stored, mm -hmm. it becomes quite ugly. I mean, you soon start realizing that there's a lot of things that 
can happen to your gold and silver. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, your gold and silver might not be there. I, I don't know if you're familiar with a law, a class action lawsuit against, I believe, JP Morgan. Mm -hmm. It was back in the 90s, where a customer had silver stored with him for gold you know, for several years, and he paid a storage fee. One day he comes in and says, I want to take delivery of my gold. And JP Morgan says, oh, well, we can buy it from you. We can mm -hmm. give you cash. He says, no, 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 I want to take delivery of my of my gold. And they say, well, well we don't have it. The customer goes, what do you mean you don't have it? Well, why do you need gold? I mean, you can just sell it for you, give you the cash. And so the customer ended up doing a lawsuit against JP Morgan, and, you know, he ended up winning. It was a class action lawsuit. And the only defense that JP Morgan had was to say it's industry practice. Because for so many uh, people in the financial world, they don't see the difference from physical paper. Sam is more or less the same thing. Mm -hmm. At some point, you're going to sell it, I'm just going to give you the cash. So the whole systemic risk approach, the fact that people are afraid that the bank might actually go bankrupt and that owning physical is ownership, whereas owing uh, paper is just an IOU, uh, that tends to be lost. Yeah. And you know, so there's a lot of misconception and, and other things in it. So the more I understood about the storage industry in general, the more I realized that we have to create a system that is so transparent that it becomes very clear for customers that we are not doing any of these things. And many customers might not you know, be aware of these sort of things, but other customers are very aware of it. And they love us because we create so much transparencies and we've basically spent five or six years talking with customers mm -hmm. and addressing their, their concerns in a way which builds trust. And, um, you know, one of the typical questions I would ask people is, uh, I mean, that, that I tell people they should ask is, hey, how do I know my goal is really there? Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes it might not be. Uh, you also ask, you know, how do I know my gold was not sold to multiple people, multiple mm -hmm. parties? Mm -hmm. How do I know my gold was not leased out, which is what happened to the German gold, you know, stored at the Fed in, in New York? Uh, how do I know that the gold is real? That it's not um, functions that's been gold plated, for example. So we have very strong, you know, processes in order to to answer those questions. And you know, I'm happy to go into the details of these. Uh, if you want, it'll just take a little while to. Yeah, no, I think we, let's let's do something like that at the end, towards the end of the episode because I I would like to go through the process at that point of what act what it would actually look like to to buy and store gold through you guys the actual process of that. But just a couple of questions building up to that. I wanted to know if the majority of your customers do they have a type of coin or mintage? Or, I'm sorry, mint or coinage that they particularly like, whether it's a maple leaf or, or something else? Or do you find that people like to diversify across a lot of different mints? Um, it very much depends on the customer. Now, if you're storing in Singapore, um, you have to be aware that not all gold is tax-free. Mm -hmm. So it, the reason for that is Singapore government made investment-grade gold and silver tax-free, but jewelry is still taxable. So when you have a, a situation like this, you have to draw a line. And what Singapore said is whatever gold or silver you're storing has to be 999 pure mm -hmm. and it has to be made either by a major mint and they have a list of coins or it has to come from an LVMA approved refiner. Got it. Because otherwise it could be considered jewelry. Yeah, or, you know, the line is a little blurry. Mm -hmm. So they're saying if, if it's one of these conditions, it will be tax free. And those are also the bars which are the most liquid. So our customers typically are buying gold and silver not because of numismatic reasons, because mm -hmm. they like the coin, but because they want something that can easily be sold or bought and that is widely recognized. Yes, okay. And, if, and because of the uh, of the tax free status, it only applies to that type of bullion. Mm -hmm. You basically you're only selling bullion which falls within these criteria. Mm -hmm. In practical terms, that means that the American Eagle's gold and the Grugerand gold are not tax free in Singapore. Gotcha. So because yeah, because they're not nine nine nine, but everything else pretty much is. So maple leaves are the most uh, popular coins by far. Uh, we sold around one point four million uh, of those, and for uh, bars we tend to sell quite a lot of metalore bars because there's a gold refinery for metalore in Who, Singapore. Who's metalore? Is that a Singapore man? Uh, no, metalore is one of the larger Swiss. 
based mints. Uh, okay. So I bought gold in in Singapore, I think on two different occasions, but just at like the U, UOB bank downstairs you can buy. And I think what they were selling was the Australian kangaroos. I think they had maple leaves and Credit Suisse. I'm not sure which Credit Suisse is obviously a Swiss bank, right? We, uh, we sell quite a bit of Credit Suisse as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, AMP is somewhat popular around here. For silver, it's the Royal Canadian Mint bars are mm-hmm. quite popular, and uh, Nadia Silva has become quite popular here. Mm, interesting. And do you have do you have a particular favorite? If you're gonna go buy some some more tomorrow to add to your your collection, would you be looking to buy something in particular? I like to buy say Nadia Silva bars. Uh, in particular, I like to buy the 15 kilogram Nadia mm-hmm. Silva bars, mm-hmm. and the reason is. Uh, you have the lowest spread and the lowest uh, per ounce price on these. I'm trying to get a picture in my head for how big 15 kilograms is, but it's it's pretty big. Yes, if you're aware of a, a 100 ounce silver bar, it's about mm-hmm. five times bigger. Okay. Now you might also have heard of 1,000 ounce silver bars. Those are the big. Those are the biggest ones, right? Those are the big brick looking ones. Yes, the good delivery bars. Now the problem with good delivery bars, which most people are not aware of, is that they're being made to be as cheap as possible. Mm-hmm. And because of that, the weight is not exact. Mm. A 1,000 ounce good delivery bar can be anywhere between 750 and 1,200 ounces, which it's, most people are astounded by it, but if you go to the LBMA definitions, that's really what it says, because they're just being cast, you know, from, from liquid silver without really going through a, a weight mm-hmm. setting system because they're cheaper. It makes it very complicated to sell because if you're buying a 1,000 ounce bar and when it arrives, we have to actually measure and say, okay, actually it's 915 ounces. So we're going to have to return you $85 mm. worth of silver. We have to buy something else. So the 15 kg bars, on the other hand, are uh, exact weight. Okay. And 15 kg, you can still carry relatively well. 1,000 ounce, that's around 32 kg. Um, that's getting kind of heavy for a person. So 15 kg tends to be a, a middle weight. As, as nice as the thousand ounce bars look, and I guess for anyone out there listening, those are the bars when you see a, a typical photo of Fort Knox or, you know, Saudi Arabia's mint or anything like that. It's the big bricks, right, Gregor? Like the, the, the big ones that you you would want to have more as like an ego thing than probably anything else. Uh, yeah, but you know, see, it always looks so nice. I took delivery of a comics bar in mm-hmm. the US and I was still living in the US and the bar we got was 40 years old. It was all brown. It had many stickers on it. It was sticky. I mean, it's a type of bar. You put it in your closet or something. Mm-hmm. Nobody would ever steal it. Uh, <laughs> somebody might somebody might throw it away, you know, thinking it's, it's uh, rubbish. <laughs> so good delivery bars are not made necessarily to look good. I mean, when they're new and, you know... It, Different refiners have different amounts mm-hmm. of efforts they put into it. But, and what, what uh, are those worth? What, what's a gold bar like that worth currently? Like half a million dollars or something something close? Okay, for gold, mm-hmm. uh, they're not 1,000 ounces. For gold, they're 100 ounces. Mm-hmm. And that would be around $650,000. Okay, wow. Yeah, don't throw it away if it's in your grandma's closet. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So talk about uh, Singapore as as a destination. I know I know you and that's what Silver Bullion is, obviously. But in terms of of safety and security for someone looking to hold precious metals overseas, what does Singapore have that you know that maybe some other countries that you would be considering don't? You know, I, I did two trips around the world. Maybe I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background just real quick about me. I, I lived twelve years in Italy, twelve years in the US, eight years in Germany. And I ended up in Germany, Germany where I paid almost 80% taxes um, mm. when I was working in intelligence and I was looking for, I didn't like it very much, so mm-hmm. I looked for a better place to go. I did two trips around the world and I sort of fell in love with Singapore mm-hmm. after reading uh, the book called Third World to First World by the Prime Minister. Pretty much build up modern Singapore the way it is. And it's almost like an instruction manual on how to build a successful city-state. That's what got me intrigued with Singapore. That's what got me to move here because it's the only place I found where the government truly is doing what's best for the people long term. Mm-hmm. Uh, normally, governments or politicians just seem to think about the next election cycle. Uh, here, policies are being done 20, 30, 40 years, you know, in, in, uh, with, with that sort of planning. Mm-hmm. And it made Singapore from being one a very poor third world country within 45 to 50 years into 
today I think there is a second or third richest per capita income, even so they have no natural resources. Right. So it's all gone, gone with prawn and good government and so on and so on. So uh, that's what fascinated me with Singapore. Uh, the country has no debt. I mean, they have debt, but they have um, uh, many more assets than that. So over the last 25 years, they were had a deficit only twice, twice. And so they're very uh, well to do. The government, the policy in Singapore is that they, they're telling the people, it's my job as a government to make sure that you get a good education, and it's mm -hmm. my job to make sure that there are jobs. But it's your job to find a job and to earn money. Right. I'm not going to employment help or these sort of things. Um, so uh, the Singapore government, what most people don't realize, is uh, also very, very well defended. Mm -hmm. it's, it's basically a, a city sitting on 700 square kilometers of soil. Uh, but they can yield an army of around 950,000 people. Right. We have so it's one and a half years. Uh, Singapore actually has military bases in the US, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Taiwan, in India, and a couple of other places. Uh, the military budget is twice that of Malaysia, which is a big neighbor. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's really very well organized. So as a jurisdiction, when it comes to storing your gold, it is a, a jurisdiction which is rich, which has become rich because of confidence. Lee Kuan Yew, the Prime Minister, pretty much summed Singapore up with that one word saying confidence. Mm -hmm. People invest in Singapore or come to Singapore because the laws are clear. There's very little, if any, corruption. Uh, Singapore is the most business friendly uh, company in the world, or mm -hmm. the uh, top four or five, according to statistics. And um, you know, Singapore would not nationalize gold or follow in, in these sort of uh, steps because it will basically be uh, almost an economic switch. Because as the government always reminds everybody, we don't have oil, we don't have, uh, you know, other resources to sell. All we have is trust that investors and entrepreneurs and other people are giving to Singapore. Mm -hmm. And so they're very keen on maintaining that. And that's very good when you're storing gold because you want to have a government which makes you know, sure to protect uh, private property. On top of that, even though it's a very small country, it's also very, very well defended. Mm -hmm. And it has a policy which is very similar to Switzerland. Um, Singapore does not buy itself as anybody uh, But when you ally yourself with somebody and meet somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's a sort of, uh, you know, sort of middle ground, middle part kind of works with everybody. Interesting. Yeah. I've spent quite a bit of time in Singapore as well. I just got done spending two months there. And it's one of the few places in the world that I would be happy to pay taxes because taxes are low, but also you, you get to see what the government is actually spending the tax on. You get world-class infrastructure, great public transit. You have a great, a very strong military, nice parks. It's, it's some place that you would actually, I think, feel good about paying taxes to support what the government is actually doing, something you could be proud in. And in terms of the military, just to complement what you said, I know a lot, actually every guy that is Singaporean has to go into the military's mandatory service, I believe. Um, and you, you have to believe that as smart as the Singapore government is, they have a lot of, of world class weaponry to defend against any type of, uh, of pesky neighbor attack in the, that could, could potentially arise in the future. But, um, just to complement what you said, I think it's an extremely secure place and, and very, um, very business and, and, uh, liberty friendly. Uh Yes, yes, definitely. Um, you, you can leave your, your backpack, you know, at Starbucks, go mm -hmm. to the toilet or something and yeah. not worry about it, you know, disappearing. I mean, you know, if somebody steals something, it's probably a tourist. Uh, just because the average Singaporean, he, he doesn't think about stealing. If he does, he, he, he kind of thinks I'm probably going to get caught. And, you know, everybody sort of has something and doesn't want to lose what they created. <laughs> you, know what so, I, you know what I heard recently, Gregor, was that some Canadian tried to rob a bank. It was the first... It was the first attempted bank robbery in the history of Singapore. And it was some Canadian tourist that was only 26 years old. Uh, and he ended up getting, he, he's getting sentenced and he's getting caned, I think, which is, he's getting six canes in the back. But, you know, at least I don't think he'll have to do too much jail time. But I thought it was really interesting that they still cane people there. And I, I actually thought it was pretty awesome. You know, I often like to tell us a story about, I forget the name, it was it Timothy McVeigh, I think. Uh -huh. It was this uh, kid for, who came to Singapore around 15 years ago or mm -hmm. something like this 
and uh, he spread, he went out and ended up vandalizing a whole bunch of cars. And in Singapore, cars are very expensive. So he vandalized 10, 15 cars and he got caught and he was going to get uh, three lashes of the cane. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and this he's really hurt. I mean, yeah. this is not like... You can one, look so. it up on YouTube and, and, and see some of these videos. Or not maybe not on YouTube, but if you look up Singapore caning, you will see some videos that will make you never want to steal in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you know it became big news in the U.S. because that was somehow politically involved, and I think half of the public in the U.S. I was living in the U.S. at the time mm-hmm. was kind of calling Singapore barbaric and you know uh, whatever. And the other half was sort of saying, "Yeah, great, man. I mean, if we were to do it here, you know, a lot of people would do silly stuff, and we wouldn't have to pay people so much to jail them." Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. but but the interesting thing is. So, um, it went all the way, way to the White House. Mm-hmm. Bill Clinton actually ended up calling the Istana, the White House equivalent here, and basically said, oh, you know, just forget about the caning, uh, just send us a kid back and, you know, uh, never mind. And Singapore responded by saying, uh, Mr. President, with respect, uh, how are we going to explain to our fellow citizens that if you have are if you're a rich kid with good connections then suddenly the law doesn't apply to you yes I like and, it. yes and how are we going to reconcile that so mm-hmm. he has been sentenced he's going to have to receive his five canes or uh, three canes and then he's going to be sent back and i like to tell us that example because the actual issue is it's such a small issue, you know, whether this kid gets re- gets caned in the, on the butt or not. But Singapore basically stood up to the United States and the U.S. president said no on a matter of principle. Mm-hmm. I like it. And how many countries are going to do that? Most countries probably are just sending the kid back with a bottle of champagne and say sorry very much for bothering you. <laughs> and and that's you know what makes Singapore Singapore. Uh, say you will stand up for Singapore and North Korea probably too. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't put Singapore as North Korea, but <laughs> <laughs> true, very true. Different, different, but uh, but at least firm in, in in different ways. So I was just thinking, like for the first, for a lot of people out there, they they may, may have only bought one or two pieces of of gold or, or silver in their entire life, or maybe just maybe just are starting to peak interest and want to go out and acquire that. I was wondering what at what point does it make sense for someone to use a provider like Silver Bullion? in their, you know, is it, is it dependent upon what their mission is or is it more dependent upon how much they're actually holding? You know, one coin, 10 coins, 100 ounces, something like that. Well, it, it's a little bit of both. Um, I think, you know, it makes sense for you to hold a little bit of gold and silver yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if, if you want to store something, everything we store is uniquely tracked. So it's different from, you know, when you hear the terms fully allocated and so on, uh, we are going beyond the fully allocated standard and everything is being tracked almost like a DHL uh, tracking system. So that your individual coins, you know, are, are tracked and you become the legal title owner of Singapore law. Now, because of this, we can't really do one or two coins because it just becomes too much effort. Right. So we standardize everything on 500 ounces of silver Mm -hmm. or 10 ounces of gold typically. And then again, you might have one kg uh, gold bars and so on. Mm -hmm. So they're different parcels, sizes, but they're always, for any type of parcel, for a maple leaf, for example, it's always going to be 500 ounces. It's never going to be 600, it's never going to be 400, it's always 500. Okay, so so you're buying essentially like a lot. Yes. Okay. It makes it much easier for auditing mm-hmm. because we are doing four audits per year. Three audits are random ones. One is a full audit of everything. And when everything is standardized with the same size, the audit becomes a lot more practical. So it gives you a lot of advantages from that side. Mm-hmm. Um, but what it means is becoming a little bit inconvenient for our customer because he cannot buy uh, fractional uh, right. ounces and so on. But that's a reality of what you, if you want to be an owner, legal title owner, mm-hmm. you cannot own a portion of a coin. Right. It, it has to be the full coin, it has to be the full bar. Mm-hmm. And because of our storage system, 
it always have to be uh, a unique discrete unit. Okay. So uh, the minimum amount will be around in US dollar terms, maybe ten thousand US dollars or so, in multiples of ten thousand. Right. So that's approximately like ten ten gold uh, gold coins or ounces. And then if you want to add more to that, you're buying it, the minimum an, another lot, right? So you essentially be going up in the in those increments. Yes. So we have parcels. We also have a mini parcel. So we mini parcel we have. Uh, 10 10 ounce silver bars so it will be 100 ounces which will be quite a bit cheaper which will be around two thousand dollars and for gold we have the 100 gram gold which um will be around uh, let's see around three thousand us dollars so so we we can do these smaller lots as well but it's always in lots so walk us through someone wants to let's say they're ready to go they want to buy uh 20 gold coins or 20 ounces of gold essentially and storm with silver boy what would that process look like well in in essence you would uh, just go to our website Mm -hmm. And uh, you would make an account uh, for storage. Mm-hmm. Uh, it will probably take around a day or so. We just need your, if it's a personal account, we just need a copy of your passport and a bank account where you're going to buy your money from into. And once that is done, then you will just go to to our website and see what type of bullion is available. Mm-hmm. Um, we have about 1,000 ounces of gold and over 200,000 ounces of silver that we're keeping in inventory at any point in time, which is uh, owned by, by us as a company. Uh, and you will just choose what bullion you want to buy and that would then um, be parcelized at the world already and, and you basically become legal title owner of that bullion. And you become owner by us issuing an invoice to you, which mm-hmm. specifies the individual parcels by number which you're getting. Once you have that, it will show up on your uh, uh, interface online. Mm-hmm. You can actually see a photo of the parcel, and you'll see a history with it as well, whether it was uh, when it was purchased, uh, and if the bullion was uh, purchased from a customer, so posted directly from a mint, mm-hmm. or it was a transfer in, then you would have a test certificate as well because we'll be testing it using using ultrasound uh, density mm-hmm. and x-ray and or electroconductivity um, <clears throat> to prove to you that it's a uh, real bullion. And you will be able to see the um, uh, insurance certificate as well as the audits which are happening four times a year. So okay. we basically go way out to make sure any doubts about whether the bullion being there and whether it's genuine are uh, is taken care of. Right. And then once once you're the owner of the of the bullion, it's sitting in in your facilities in a vault. It's not necessarily in your own locker with your own name on it correct it's it's in kind of a master vault of some sort okay so the facility is called the safe house uh, you can go to our website and you can see a video of it so you can get a feeling uh, of what it looks like it's around ten thousand square foot square foot vault and we have two ways we can store uh, if you're buying directly through silver bullion it will be segregated ownership by parcel. That is a technical term. And it basically means you have a little or a large tamper evident bag where your bullion is inside. Mm-hmm. So that bullion is then put into um, a pallet cage, basically a big cage, which is then stored within the vault. In that pallet cage, there will be other bags from other customers. Mm-hmm. And it is like this because at some point you might want to sell your parcel. And when you sell your parcels, we don't actually go and move that parcel from another pallet and so on, Mm -hmm. because somebody else might then buy it. If you want to have your own uh, box, that's also an option, uh, but it would essentially be a safe deposit box. And the the advantage of having your own box is that you have more privacy, uh, but the downside is that you actually have to be physically in Singapore to to put your bullion inside. Uh but that could just be a trip. It doesn't. It doesn't require you to be living there. Right. Actually, you you have the option. Uh, we can put the bullion inside the box for you. Mm-hmm. So you can do that remotely. You can tell us that you want to put uh, four thousand ounces of silver into our silver safe deposit box, which is a very large one. It can store two hundred kg um, of material, mm-hmm. and we will then take the bullion. We will still parcelize it. 
um, into these bags and then we will put it inside so we will have a video of the whole process the box will then be closed it will be sealed with a temper evidence seal with the heavy duty evidence seal you can see it online mm -hmm. and that video and the keys to the box along with the documentation of the seal will, will then be sent to you to the US or wherever you're living now for you as citizens, the nice thing about this is the IRS is quite straightforward in saying that whatever's in your safe deposit box does not con constitute a financial account. Okay, so, yeah. for our understanding, it means that it becomes non-reportable. Mm -hmm. However, the definition of a safe deposit box is not just that it's in a box, it's a matter of access. Mm -hmm. In other words, once we send you the key, we can no longer access that box. If you want to sell it or do something else with it, you actually have to come to Singapore or you have to have an authorized representative gotcha. somebody you can trust gotcha. to actually access that box, that box. And is there, if you wanted to have your own dedicated box, would there be a yearly storage cost for that? Uh, yes. Okay. So the, when you are storing with silver bullion storage, where mm -hmm. it's parcelized by bag, insurance is fully included. Mm -hmm. If you put it in a safe deposit box, then you have two two fees. One is the, the safe deposit box itself, which comes with a certain amount of included insurance. And then you have the optional adding insurance to it. Now, we have two types of boxes. One box is a silver box, which can hold up to 200 kg. It's very large, but you can only put or insure silver in it because mm -hmm. it's being stored in the silver vault. And from insurance regulations, we can only have silver in it. And that box costs around, in US dollar terms, around 1,200 US dollars per year. Mm -hmm. um, and your other option is to, and it comes with $50,000 worth of insurance included. The other option is you go with the gold well, uh, safe deposit box, mm -hmm. which is considerably smaller. It can hold up to 500 ounces of gold, so around 15, 16 kg. So we can hold around 600,000 to $700,000 worth of gold. And it will cost uh, 950 US dollars per year. Uh, but it includes a $200,000 insurance instead, which okay. uh, we charge around 20 basis points, 0.2% of insurance per year. So if you deduct that from the insurance, that then the cost is around $500 per, per year. Gotcha. And you can put up to $650,000 worth of gold. So percentage-wise, it's a pretty good way to store uh, if you fill the box up. And if you just wanted to store it by parcel in the bag, is there an additional cost for that once you own the gold? No, it's just a simple fee. It, it includes full, full insurance. Mm -hmm. And the cost is around 19 cents per year mm -hmm. per ounce of silver, or around six US dollars per ounce of gold. So we're talking around, depending, regardless of what the price of gold or silver is, so we're talking around 0.45% uh, yeah. for uh, gold <laughs> or silver, we're talking about 0.9%. 0.95 something like this at current rates i have to laugh because i i bought a piece of gold in hong kong and i finally got a safety deposit box and this goes back like three years because the waiting list to get a safety deposit box is crazy so i finally got one i'm like okay well now i got it i, I need to go put something in it right i should certainly put something in it so i went and bought one gold coin so in my in my safety deposit box in hong kong i have one gold coin which cost i don't know let's say 1200 dollars but then my safety deposit box cost me, I don't know, like $100, $150 a year. <laughs> so I'm paying like 15% just to hold it there for the year. So either I need to, to get get rid of that or or add significantly to it. But Yeah, so that's the issue with safety deposit boxes. If you if you fill them up, they're quite price, effect, price uh, effective, but if you are cost effective. But if you just, you know, just put a few coins in there, and it, it'll become very expensive on a percentage basis. Absolutely. So how about the liquidity? If someone buys through you guys, and let's say they're storing gold, and they want to they wanna sell or, or liquidate half of it, is that a pretty instantaneous type of thing? And, and, and if so, then what's, is it basically at spot rate, Might, uh, give or take a percentage? Yep. Um, you can see the buy and sell rates online whether it's for storage or, you know, in the store here, it's the same rate. And we are, quite, we are quite competitive, especially with buybacks. We had people who sold us back two, three million dollars in one go. It's not a problem. We have a refinery here. If we have large amounts that we have to handle quickly, we can handle that. We'll pay within two days, typically. So you can log in at any point in time and then your money will be credited back to your bank account uh, within two business days. Or 
uh, you can use the money for uh, P2P lending or other purposes like this. So it's quite straightforward. You would basically just go online, you select which parcels you want to sell, and then you just make a PO, a purchase order, and you receive some money. Very cool. So, oh, you know, I, I saw on your guys' website that you have some type of peer-to-peer lending program with, with the, the lending backed by gold. Yep, or silver. That's that's really cool. So we had, yeah, we had. I, I keep saying gold, sorry, but we'll just say precious metals. Um, so we had Brett uh, Crosby on from Pier Street a few weeks back, and we're all about peer to peer lending with some type of you know asset underlying it. Because um, we've both done Johnny and I have both done lending club accounts, and we just watch the loans get written off and take losses on those. And then with Pier Street, it's been an awesome experience because there's been some loans that have gone into default, but there haven't been any losses to. To any of the the lenders so i'm excited uh, about your guys program can you tell us a little bit about how that would work yep um basically it all started when we had a customer who asked to ask us for a loan mm-hmm. he had some gold he didn't want to sell it but he needed cash and that was about three years ago and we had no way of doing this so we had to sell this bullion but but that kind of set me on a quest on trying to figure out how to be able to to say yes to such a request. Mm-hmm. And after one and a half years of, you know, talking with lawyers, talking with banks, and so on and so on, we, we realized that uh, from a regulatory point of view, it was possible for us to create a peer-to-peer lending system in Singapore. So government is actually supporting uh, fintech and so on. So they're quite happy that we are going to do this. And the basic idea is that one customer can lend uh, cash to another customer using the borrower's collateral, I mean, mm-hmm. bullion as collateral. So, for example, if I have a $100,000 worth of gold, uh, I can take a $50,000 loan mm-hmm. and I will just post a, a borrowing request uh, on the site. Um, we have a system which, which is kind of like a bid and ask. So I can say, okay, I want to borrow... $50,000 at 3% for six months. And potential lenders can send CSAT offer and they mm-hmm. can either accept it or they can make their own lending offers and say, well, I have $50,000, mm-hmm. but I want 4%. And so we basically created a bid and ask system whereby the system creates its own interest rate. Ah. So the borrower, for example, might say, okay, I'm, I'm willing to go up to 3.5%. So lender might say, okay, I'll take three and a half percent, and then you have a fifty thousand dollar loan contract created at three and a half percent for mm. six months. And so you and you guys handle everything in between. Like if if that loan goes into default, you would reassign the the gold right, or I'm sorry, the precious metal rights to the new owner. Yes. So the way it works is we, we're very conservative because mm-hmm. we wanted to make it very safe. Mm-hmm. So we require two hundred percent collateral. Uh, so if 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 you want, if you have a hundred thousand dollars, you have to you can only get a loan up to fifty thousand yeah. dollars. And if during the life of the loan, say the six months, uh, the collateral were to crash and go to one hundred twenty five percent, we'll have a margin call sent out to the borrower, uh-huh. telling him, hey, you might want to add some more cash or some more collateral, and. If nothing happens and if the colla- if the ratio goes down to one hundred ten percent, then we liquidate the bullion. We basically sell the bullion and we make sure that the lender gets its principal and interest back, wow. and whatever balance is left goes back to the borrower. It's really sophisticated. And would the collateral drop be based on the price of precious metals, or because the borrower is moving some of the collateral out? Oh no, no. See, see, once a loan is done, the bullion is basically locked. Okay. meaning a borrower cannot sell it or ask for delivery or so. So that bullion basically has a claim on it. Okay. And the collateral valuation is recalculated every three minutes. Mm-hmm. So it's just based on the price of, of whatever they're, they're holding. Exactly. Got it. And if, that, if you have a big crash of the value of gold, for example, mm-hmm. and it goes down to 110%, then it will trigger the, the liquidation event. And the 110% gives us some buffer. So even if the market moves very quickly, you know, so there will be enough capital in there. I mean, uh, collateral to fully pay back the lender. And we did it this way because it it makes it very safe for the lender. Mm-hmm. And because it becomes very safe for the lender, it means the lender is willing to accept a lower interest rate, which then is good for the borrower because sure. he can borrow at a low rate. Yeah, I like it. So, and is it obviously for borrowers, they need to be silver bullion customers and have 
uh, and have Bullion with you guys. How about the lenders? Do they need to be they need to be customers and or do they need to have Bullion with you or can they just jump on and, and take part in the lending process? Yep. As a lender, you just need to open an account with us. Mm -hmm. you, you still need a storage account because the storage account allows us to do our AML and KYC checks, you know, basically make sure you're not a, a track dealer or something. And when uh, then you just need cash. So you don't need to buy any bullion. You you just get, get the account set up and then you can lend your money out to, to whichever offer you like. Hmm. Uh, the process is very very simple uh, you can you know lend out your money in two or three minutes that's all it takes is it usually done in in Singapore dollar or US dollars uh, we have two currencies we have Singapore dollars and US dollars oh, I'm so smart aren't I <laughs> yeah actually we have four durations as well we have one month very uh -huh. short-term loans we have six months 12 months and 24 months and two currencies so essentially we have eight markets and each one of them might have slightly different interest rates mm-hmm and does it ever does it ever take place that the l lender and borrower negotiate on the payback? Does is a, as a borrower ever say, "Hey, um, I'm willing to you know give up some of my bullion at this rate or something at like a, a, a decrease rate, so I don't have to pay back the cash"? They cannot negotiate with each other directly. Uh, because they just say they, they only see each other through say anonymous um, storage IDs that they get. Mm -hmm. So the borrower and lender don't necessarily know each other directly. Um, but if you're a borrower and you want to to close your loan early, it's possible for you to do. But you have to pay the interest in full. So in other words, mm. if I have a six months loan and after two months I really need to get my gold or something. Uh, the borrower would have to pay the full interest for six months mm -hmm. and you know fulfill his contract terms basically just early and you know the lender typically is happy because he's getting the full interest uh, but getting his money early so it's it's quite quite a good deal for him uh, from the lender side uh, he would have to wait until the loan is over uh, we are sort of looking you know in the future we might be able to have somebody else buy his loan up you know, which which could be another step. We have to look mm -hmm. into the regulatory environment to do this. But yeah, if you're a lender, you typically, you know, you've committed your money for six months. You have to wait for the six months to get some money back. Wow. That's a really exciting program. We'll have to share more details with our audience. I know that's a, a very hot topic and a, a very interesting investment category for everybody now with this the, the whole kind of peer-to-peer -peer evolution and, and almost revolution. And I just have a few more questions for you, Gregor. Uh, one thing I, want, I forgot to clear up in the beginning can anyone open an account with Silver Bullion from basically any any country, or is there a, is there any limitations there? Yeah, from pretty much anywhere. I mean, I mean, there are a few countries which uh, you know, North Korea maybe, and and uh, a few countries like this where we might not want to open an account with. But yeah, basically everybody else, it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we very much welcome U.S. citizens. I know U.S. citizens are having a lot of trouble. <laughs> we're we're, discri we're discriminated against everywhere now. I know. <laughs> you know, I, I think the same thing is going to happen to Europeans. Yeah. I, I think I think the EU is going to copy the US taxation model and yeah. tax everybody on citizenship. Too. Un unfortunately, it's either going to go that way or, or everyone's going to start putting up a fight against FACTA and uh, it'll go the other way. But I, I, I tend to agree with you. So we'll see. I would just encourage Europeans to get out there and, and get all those foreign bank accounts set up while it's easy because as an American, it's, it's darn near impossible now. Um, I wanted to see with uh, a lot of people probably wondering if they own bullion with silver bullion or storing it there with you. And for some reason, they want to get it out. They want to get it to their house. Is there a process for you guys actually sending the bullion overseas? Uh, we can. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you there are two ways of doing this. I mean, there's always the option of selling it to us mm -hmm. and you buying it in the U.S. During no normal market conditions, that might be cheaper because... Right. Shipping bullion internationally, shipping bullion in the U.S. is very easy uh, with the United Postal Service. They're basically subsidizing, you know, bullion shipments. Uh, but internationally, it's a lot more expensive because you have to go with specialized um, uh, shipping companies. Companies normally will be Prinks, Malka Ahmed, Loomis, you know, these are the typical names. Mm -hmm. And if the shipment is quite small, if you're just shipping, you know, 20 ounces of gold, it might not make that much sense to do. 
Mm -hmm. uh, if it becomes 400, 500 ounces, then, you know, it, it makes a lot more sense. So, yeah, we can ship internationally, but, you know, sometimes it might be easier for you to just sell the bullion with us. We send you some money and you would buy it in the U.S. But if you want it to be shipped, not a problem. I guess it always goes back to what's the point of actually doing this in the first place. So if you set up an account with Silver Bullion, you're holding, you know, 50, 100 ounces of, of, of uh, gold or the the same in silver or other precious metals, you know, you're, you're kind of doing it as, as a hedge and an insurance policy. So if some type of systemic failure occurs or World War III breaks out, you know, you probably don't want to be sending that around the world chasing you. The safest place to have that may well be in silver bullion in Singapore, where it can, you know, you can basically wait and see what happens to currencies around the world. You can wait and see what happens, you know, geopolitically around the world. And you know, it's safe there. You can either liquidate it through you guys, or you can wait it out and, you know, and basically see what transpires. Right. So I have to ask, since you've been in finance, um, just one last question. Is there other things that you invest in? Is this, is this pretty much where you have uh, the majority of your, your assets and asset allocation? Yeah, you know, the majority for me is in precious metals right now, mm -hmm. the company itself mm -hmm. and in P2P loans. Um, I, I had an experience where I invested a little bit in, in uh, mines, actually, also about two, two years ago, you know, when mines were very, very cheap. Wow, yeah. But what happened to me is I opened up a bank account with a major international broker. I had to do it through Hong Kong because I didn't have a branch in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And um, I basically bought shares on the Toronto Stock Exchange using Canadian dollars. And one day, uh, and I just bought these shares and I just kind of left it there, sort of a long term, you know, buy and forget, wait a couple of years, let it go, sort of, you know, thing. And one day I'm getting an email from my broker telling me that if I'm not going to log into my account within the next week, then the state of Connecticut is going to escheat my account holdings. <laughs> and I thought it was a joke. I thought it was like some sort of spam or something. Yeah. I want to delete it, but then I thought that the return address actually was, or it was actually coming from my broker. And I looked at it more and I realized my last four digits of my account actually was my account. So I realized this thing is serious. And so I called them up and they basically told me that, yeah, yeah because they're based in Connecticut, for people who don't access their accounts every one and a half years or so, uh, state law will will basically as cheat, which, which basically means confiscate the holdings as abandoned property. Sickening. And you know, here I am. I was. I've never been in Connecticut. I'm a German citizen, opening an account in Hong Kong, buying some Canadian shares. And some of the state of Connecticut thinks that it's okay for them to take my account away. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, it, it, it was sort of that experience where I just kind of said, you know what, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'll just keep it in gold and silver for now. And I'll just kind of see what happens. Yeah. Because if you have financial accounts nowadays, you, you really have to run after them. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's scary it's that a, they would just send you just an email and, you know, on short notice. I've heard of them doing that, you know, over the course of uh, like five to 10 years if people because they think people are, are dead or, or, you know, gone off the, the face of the earth. But that is incredibly frightening that they would do that after a year to a foreign resident. Exactly. And it kind of, you know, it, it reflects you know, how, how you know, the dire situation of many of the U.S. states where they try to come up with some ways of creating more revenue. Mm -hmm. But they're doing it in a way which, you know, destroys so much trust. And it also highlights this whole issue of jurisdiction. What do I know that my broker actually is, has been founded in Connecticut and mm -hmm. that somehow now I'm subject to Connecticut law? So for silver bullion, I basically made everything so that we are only subject to uh, Singapore law, so mm -hmm. we are not subject to US law and or twenty other law, and we set up our contracts in a way that it's illegal for us to release information, yeah. you know, to the US or anybody else. Uh, they would have to go through a Singapore court, and that's one of the key reasons why we had to build our own vault because um, most of the vaults out there are run by global companies or US-based companies, which ultimately always have to do whatever the US law might say. And if you have a nationalization event, then you might have your, your gold stored abroad, 
But if you're storing it with a US-based or US-exposed vault provider, then it won't do you much good because that gold is most likely going to go back mm -hmm. uh, to the US. And if you read vault contracts, you will typically found, find a vault uh, force majeure clause, which basically states that the vault provider is to be indemnified for anything that happens to your bullion because of any governmental action by any government. So they have any to any clause in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was one of the reasons which, you know, I, I wanted to move out from our original outsource storage and, and build our own. Very cool. Well, Gregor, thanks so much for coming on and, and sharing your knowledge and experience and, and most importantly, what you've built over at Silver Bullion and the reasons why you did it and the, all the great services that you have. It's uh, a lot for us to take in and we appreciate uh, the time and the knowledge share. We'll be sure to include a lot of photos of actually Silver Bullion, what Gregor and his company have built over there and lots of notes and links to further information for all the audience's le uh, reading and and uh, entertainment. Gregor, anything else uh, you want to touch on before we take off here? Uh, well, you know, I always say that it's always best for people to to see for themselves. So, you know, if you if you want to go and see operations in Singapore and you come to Singapore, please look us up. We can arrange some visits to the walls as well. Mm -hmm. We can show you how bullion testing actually works so we can peer inside the bars and you know make sure it's real most of our customers they really enjoy that and you know almost every time we show people what we do they end up becoming customers so right. see for yourself and i always tell my customers ask questions we like customers who ask questions <laughs> <laughs> good stuff well i'm sure you get a, a, a several questions after this guys if you have questions leave them in the boss lounge on facebook or in the show notes on this episode and we'll make sure between uh, gregor johnny and myself that we get everything answered so gregor thanks again for coming on it's been a lot of fun and uh we'll catch up with you soon okay great thank you very much take care man i really enjoyed that episode i learned a ton of about, I mean, pretty much everything I ever wanted to know about investing in precious metals I've gotten from this podcast. And what's really cool is even if you don't want to invest in precious metals right now, first off, you'll have a very clear understanding of how to do it the correct way, uh, the type of questions to ask if you ever do uh, invest, whether you do it with Silver Bullion or, or a different company or if you want to hold it yourself. But what's also really cool is for people that are looking for another peer-to-peer -peer lending service besides Pure Street that is backed by something, in this case, backed by physical gold or silver, I think this is an awesome idea. I'm definitely going to check it out myself. I think it's very fair that the the returns are a little bit lower but it's backed by the gold or silver which is something one of those things where i feel like if the if the economy started dropping and people start defaulting on their loans that's something that you would probably want to end up investing in anyway just because the, the you know the economy would be so unstable so it'd almost be good uh, to get your your money back uh, in these precious metals because that's something that you should probably be holding on to during those times anyways versus with pure street you know if there's a big you know economic meltdown or you know the real estate you know kind of bust is one of those things where the you know if that all happens at once the currency and stocks and everything may, may go down as well so i think of it as if you are very very you know either high risk or optimistic um <laughs> i would probably invest in things like the index funds uh, you know and maybe keep cash on hand for something like that or real estate you know and buying low when when things are things on a downturn or if you want to really play it safe i think the precious metals is a, is a sure shot uh, it's a good shot at you know, keeping something that is going to be more stable so if you have money that you want to kind of preserve uh, i really think that the precious metals is the way to go but for me personally because i like really high risk investments uh, uh, in terms of high risk, high reward, things like buying index funds when the economy might be down, for instance, I'd personally rather keep my cash super liquid on hand to be able to buy things like that. But this is an awesome alternative for people. And I think I have a feeling, you know, and we'll have Sam talk about this in his next uh, investment update, if he's going to put more money into precious metals. But I have a personally, I have a feeling he will, because I think he's a little bit more towards the wealth preservation side than I am. Uh, so we'll see. But I want to give a quick shout out and a big thank you to our first review from Botswana. So all the way from the country of Botswana, this is from Brajo. Simply amazing. Growing up, we knew that there was one of a few ways to invest. This unpacks all different ways. Crazy how I've learned even more. I'm not even halfway out. Shout out from Africa, man. So thank you so much. All the way from Botswana. If everyone wants to leave a review, please go to investlikeaboss.com. Click on bonus and you can see how you can 
enter to win a $25 Amazon gift card simply by leaving a review and sending us a screenshot of your review. But either way, appreciate it so much. This helps us grow this podcast more than you know. So see you all next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Best Like a Boss podcast. Join our mailing list at investlikeaboss.com to get exclusive access to our insider investment portfolios and our private members forum. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends and leave us a review in the iTunes store. It helps more than you know. See you guys next week.